Well, I am really, really excited that Steve Rapaski is here. He is the president of Berg Bees from Pittsburgh. And he is the founder of the very first community apiary in the country. He's also the vice president of the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association and sits on the board of directors for the American Beekeeping Federation. He is committed to educational outreach, providing beekeeping classes for the beginning beekeeper. And you have how many hives? Personally, it's somewhere around 100. 100 hives. How many hives are in the apiary? The... We'll get to that. Okay. Okay. Here's Steve Rapaski. Thank you. I like to walk around, so I'm going to undo this here. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, although, I'm going to, uh, full disclosure, go Penn State. <laughs> I'm a Penn State guy. Grew, uh, grew up with uh, being a fan of Penn State, went to school to Penn State, and um, I'll always be a Penn Stater. So sorry for the Ohio guys out there. Uh, so running a community apiary. Uh, we claim to be the nation's first community APR. I have yet to have somebody come up and dispute that. Um, but it's not whether or not we're the, the actual first community APR in the nation or not. It's more of the struggles that we've seen and the, and the hurdles that we've accomplished um, to get to where we are today. Bird Bees is a relatively new uh, urban organization. It was formed out of the result of the growth and interest of urban beekeeping and, and sustainable beekeeping. And uh, we're only, was this 2016, right? Already? <laughs> uh, so we're about seven, or seven years old now. Um, so we're still relatively young in the, in the, the beekeeping world. Uh, but we do have a memorandum of understanding with Penn State, uh, their extension, uh, basically in that we are associated with them, but we are not governed by them in any way, shape, or form. We actually assist them in the educational arm. So, when their master gardener programs are looking for people to speak on honeybees or pollinators, we assist with those types of things. Uh, but they were also crucial in our startup because when we were looking for office space, looking for guidance, looking for support, um, they were a key uh, partner in that aspect. We also had several other startup partners. Uh, the Pittsburgh Zoo uh, gave us the first space to put a couple of hives as a uh, test area, if you will, for urban urban hives. The Sprout Fund uh, out of Pittsburgh gave us uh, some grant money. Uh, Grow Pittsburgh, <coughs> excuse me, is the um, urban gardening um, group in Pittsburgh. They supported us just um, in basic uh, overall support, just saying, hey, yeah, this group is, is real. And Slow Food Pittsburgh, of course, in the slow food movement was key for our startup. Our mission statement is very simple is to promote beekeeping and beekeepers as a vital part of sustainable agriculture in Pittsburgh and its surroundings. Um, just within the last seven years, we've seen a huge growth in the interest of um, homegrown food, if you will. Where does your food come from? Um, sustainable beekeeping, sustainable chicken farming, those types of things, and we're here to fill in the void uh, where beekeepers were not historically. So we were founded in 2008 uh, by four beekeepers in interested in promoting beekeeping. I wasn't the founder, I was actually the fifth founder, if you will. Um, the four beekeepers, two of them came from Chicago, two of them were, were local Pittsburghers, and I came on number five. Um, as a, just a, a meeting of the mind, so to speak. How do we promote beekeeping in an urban area, and how do we make this movement grow? We had four demonstration apiaries up and running by spring of 2009, along with some classes. So it was a, it was a quick turnaround. Uh, we weren't officially a club, even though we named ourselves. We were actually just five people, then six people, then seven people, and, but that's how we grew. <laughs> In 2010 is when we opened up the nation's first community apiary. As we mentioned, um, it's not the, the important thing that we're the first, but it was an idea that has grown, and we have uh, received interest from other communities in, in Pennsylvania and other communities in, across the United States, Denver, Boston, Milwaukee, uh, several down in Virginia, West Virginia. So the, the concept has grown and we're going to talk about some of the struggles that we had as a group uh, in getting this apiary running and what we had to do. So what is a community apiary? Well first and foremost it's a concept similar to a community garden. 
basically the grounds and the um, the apiary itself are owned or leased by the club so in this case we lease it from the city of Pittsburgh um, the hive the bees and the honey is owned by the individuals we really don't dictate what they can do to their hives or how they do it but we're there for support and guidance as needed um, whether we offer classes workshops or just a mentor type of a program it's a focal point for our educational programs, beekeeping classes, per other school programs. We have open, apri open apiaries, say that 10 times fast. Um, open apiaries, which is where we open it up to the non-beekeeping public. Those that have an interest in beekeeping and pollinators, uh, they want to become a bee curious. You know, what does it look like inside of a hive? Uh, see what a beekeeper does on a daily basis. And we hold those once or twice a month, depending on weather and uh, interest. And of course, we hold our club, club picnics there as well. The biggest challenge we had in an urban setting is to choose a site. In a rural area, it's not too bad. You have 5, 10, 15, 50 acres, whatever, plop your bees down and, and you're pretty much good to go. But in an urban setting, we're very limited on space. So we needed a welcoming community. How do you explain to a community that you're bringing in 40,000 stinging insects <laughs> times 10, right? So we needed a welcoming community, and Pittsburgh certainly is welcoming. Any of, the, any of you have been there, the people were great, um, but when it comes to stinging insects, it starts to raise a few eyebrows. We also needed room to grow. How do we expand if this program is successful? Where do we go? We need it centrally located for ease of use. Right? Can't have it, uh, not that there's a rural area in Pittsburgh, but certainly we don't want to have to climb up hillsides and fight all kinds of stairs um, to get in. As you know, Pittsburgh is right in the middle of three rivers and several mountains and, and everything else. So if we have to cross too many bridges, we don't go to that location. Um, that's kind of the mindset in Pittsburgh. We need it to be fenced or have the ability to fence it. Not so much for bears, but because of just general vandalism protection, security. And we had to have it accessible by car, meaning I should put truck in there so that we could bring hives in, bring equipment, haul honey out, those types of things. And that's tough in an urban setting. It's not as easily um, to find as you'd think. And it had to be sufficiently isolated. In urban settings, there's really no such thing as isolation. So we had to really be picky about where we wanted to go. And if my, there we go, technology would work, we ended up finding it. It took us about a good solid nine to 10 months to uh, pour over maps, talk to our councilmen, uh, talking to the mayor, talking to um, redevelopment associations, those types of places to really look at what we can do. The city parks were out of the question at that point in time because there was a lot of hesitation about liability and overuse of the area, so to speak. Um, so we ended up in the east end of Pittsburgh, namely the Homewood section of Pittsburgh. Uh, Homewood is not exactly the uh, Diamond of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a low income, high crime area, uh, but that's where we found the isolation because there was a lot of vacant properties, um, vacant lots, those types of places. Ultimately, we ended up with one and a half acres. It was owned by the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we leased it for a five year term with an option to renew for 99 years for a five year trial period. Um, Fortunately, the city was never good with their paperwork or their books, and we never got charged, nobody ever questioned it, and we're still there. So, it actually, the property just did get purchased by our Animal Rescue League, and um, we are developing an agreement with that, formal agreement with them. Uh, they're excited to have us right across the street from their new uh, facility. So, we're going to be there long term. Um, as I mentioned, we got a grant for $8,000 for startup costs. This was namely um, earmarked for fencing and gravel and those types of things, and I'll show you why. Um, tree Vitalize came in as well, and we had 15 pollinator trees planted. These were all eight to 10 foot uh, fully established root ball trees. Uh, we ended up with red bud, um, buckeyes reluctantly. Um, <laughs> what else? Uh, red bud, buckeyes, basswood, service berry, and there's one other that I can't think off the top of my head. Um, but we had several trees, and they've all done very, very well in the area. So this is what the area looked like. Um, as I mentioned, it is low income and it is high crime, but it is still an established community with a very energetic and a very involved 
um, community base. So as we get in closer, we found this vacant lot that was almost actually the edge of the community. Um, it was a vacant lot. Uh, it was up against one of our transit busways. And back here are some industrial buildings, but then you have residential even further. And then of course, right across the street was residential. However, with a lot of the um, low income, several of these houses were vacant, but there was still, like I said, an active community that had an involvement. And they, they threw a fit. You know, they didn't want stinging insects, um, but the, the interesting thing was, and I'll show you what this picture, this lot looked like, it was an overgrown vacant lot that when we, uh, let me go back here, when we started to clean it up, we were finding tires, drug needles, um, unmentionables, you know, those types of things, and initially the community would have rather had that than have bees, which is was frustrating and sad in a way. Uh, but we had several meetings with the community. Uh, we got them involved, and it actually turned around to the point that they became very protective of the site after the bees were there. And because, and I'll show you why, uh, it became a place for them to go, um, just to get away and to, it was beautified the neighborhood, so to speak. So we found a lot. We came up with some, some diagrams and some drawings as to how we conceptually were, were thinking about laying it out. And uh, the sun, it's in full sun, it had nice south-facing sun. Uh, it already had a chain link fence along the busway, so that helped. We had some trees, we had some shrubs, uh, we had a great patch of Japanese knotweed, right? <laughs> Not native, but fabulous for pollinators, uh, namely honeybees. Um, but we had a whole bunch of stuff in there. We also had a whole bunch of asphalt parking lot, fragments, tires, you name it. So. Conceptually, this is what we came up with. And we laid it out, and we said, this is how we think we want it to go. And ultimately, the basics of it stayed the same. We changed a few things. We still have the infinity path. Um, this is meant to represent the waggle dance of the honeybee. Right? It was too small of a lot, otherwise we would have done a lot of them. But uh, <laughs> the infinity path is still there. The hives are relatively in the same spot. We had an idea of about a, a small wetland area because there was a lot of drainage there. Um, that never came to fruition, but it is still very wet, which actually works out because it's a watering area for the, for the bees naturally. So that's what we, we visualized. Then we had to get in and do the groundwork. <laughs> and this is where the work started. And first thing, before we did anything, was we put up a lovely sign that says, Welcome to the Community Apiary. Unfortunately, behind the sign was lots of tall grass, tires, concrete, <laughs> stuff like that. So this is what it looked like. And this was after we mowed it. Um, it took several passes of, of mowing to expose everything that was there. And just an idea, this is the busway in the back. We've got residential over here. Um, the trees aren't there yet from Tree Vitalized, but we had a lot of figuring what to do here. So we started by cleaning up, we're getting rid of all the tires, um, you know, drug paraphernalia, things like that. No bodies were found in this process, so that's a good thing. Uh, but it was a mess. Um, so we, we did have a nice area, but we had to clean it up. Well, fortunately we had lots of volunteers and lots of interest from not only beekeepers, people interested in uh, enhancing the site, uh, community members, community leaders, those types of things, we got it done. And all this, those few pictures that you saw all happened within about a three month time frame. So from February, March into early April. Um, this was, uh, I believe it was late March, early April, we got the fence up uh, and the process was still clearing out tires. We had some work days, got the fence up, we tilled up some ground, we got rid of a lot of debris. What we found out was there was a lot of fill in this area, so which to, is to be expected, it's an urban area, but we did find pockets of good soil, namely right around the fence line, so this is all very good soil. Uh, we had to have some raised beds down here because after about an inch of topsoil, it was concrete and rocks and not very good dirt, uh, but we got there. So eventually we put some native plantings in. We use our um, the company is called Ernst Conservation Seeds out of Meadville, Pennsylvania. Uh, they donated a lot of the seeds. This was taken a few years ago, um, but you can see part of the infinity path here, a couple of the raised beds. The raised beds we use um, to focus on non, 
I'll use the word non-native, but we used one was uh, all mints because we know mints will, will take over everything. So we contained mints in one bed. Uh, we had another bed that was just garden plants, like tomatoes and peppers and things like that. And then I forget what the third bed was, um, hostas or something goofy. But this is all native back here. Um, this is what we call our native meadow. And it was, just, it's, I wish I had a picture of it now. This was back in 2013, this picture was taken. And in three years, we've got this great diversity of native flowers coming up at all times of the year uh, during the growing season, which is fabulous. This is an aerial view uh, from a few years ago. Again, our busway here, our urban site, uh, we've got 25 hives inside the apiary here. You can see the infinity path, which kind of got cut off by our um, gravel driveway there. Ultimately what we ended up doing, instead of removing the asphalt, we just covered it with gravel, used it as the as a base for our beehives, place that we could park in and drive in with our vehicles, and then of course you can see the native meadow has um, really come along. There's a lot of uh, butterfly weed in there, and ironweed, and Joe pie weed, and uh, a lot of the earlier flowers and whatnot, um, Jerusalem artichoke, um, mints, you name it. It's quite a bit. So this is the aerial view, and it worked out very well. Um, but that wasn't because we didn't have help. We had tons of help. But we also needed money, and money is always the issue, right? We all, we're all looking for more money. So how we did it as a new beekeeping club, uh, we didn't have 5013 status at the time. We were just a, a basic beekeeping club looking to promote beekeeping. So we had to raise money, so we held beekeeping classes, which was very, very popular. We were doing four a year and maxing out our classes at 75 at each class. So we had a lot of people interested in, in beekeeping, which was fabulous, and especially at that time when we could have used the funds. Uh, we have since leveled off and got smarter about the number of classes and the number of people. So we, we actually capped them off at about 35 people per class. But, uh, so we have first year beekeeping, second year beekeeping, extracting workshops, um, wax processing, you name it, if there's a topic related to beekeeping, we hold a class or have held a class on it, and the money that's raised from those dues went to the apiary. Um, we have membership dues through our club. They're minimal, they're about $10 a person. That goes towards the apiary. Uh, and then of course the lease itself for the apiary. Um, and the lease, let me go back here with the lease, I think I get into it a little bit later, but I'll mention it just in case I don't. With the lease, what happens is each person puts in an application for the apiary, um, and it's been <coughs> fair, it's leveled off. We had an, a lot of our applications initially. Uh, they all often now level off where if we have a couple of vacancies, they get filled. We don't have to have the application process, but there is a small fee of about $10 that goes with the application. Uh, and then, of course, once you're approved, there's a fee of $125 a year um, for maintenance of the fencing and things like that. And um, I think you also have to have some volunteer hours, and I do believe we get into that. We also had guest lecture series, so we're raising money every chance we get. The open apiaries were, were uh, suggested donations. We sold honey from our hives that we had at various places. And at that point, we had them at the zoo and uh, I believe Whole Foods were the only two sites that we had. So the honey we had was being sold for $15 a pound, and we actually had waiting lists for it for the following year. That's how popular it was. So we had our own label form. That money was earmarked for this apiary. We brought in school groups just to get the word out. We didn't charge the school groups, um, but certainly we brought a lot of kids in. This group here, um, was, is one of our favorite groups. They come in every year, they bring 120 kids, ages six to nine years old, and uh, we suit them up. It's an all day event, they rotate. It's basically a, a tour for them all day. They come in for an hour each, and we get them into the hives. And as you can see, they're, they're right up in there. And they're telling us about the bees, which is even cooler. But it's, um, it's become a popular event for, for the club itself. Here you go, here's the slide I was thinking of. So the requirements of our lessees, what do they have to do? Well, they have to take our 101 class or some beekeeping class equivalent. We want them to be good stewards of bees and beekeeping. Uh, they have to sign a yearly lease. That should say 20 hours, not two zero hours or two zero. Oh. Um, $125 a year and you're allowed one hive per person, mainly limited to space. 
Uh, we've actually changed that to one and a half hives. So for those of you that are beekeepers, you can have a full hive and we allow them to have a small nucleus colony as a resource hive. And then of course, the 20 hours of volunteer time, if they fulfill those 20 hours, we reduce that cost to $75 a year after the fact. So uh, mainly because a lot of people refused to do the 20 hours. It was hard to get people to do volunteer work. And volunteer work is everything from uh, mowing the grass, showing up at a work day, volunteering at a class, doing a school program. Doesn't take long for 20 hours to build up over a year. Uh, but it's worked out well and people are very happy with that setup. Um, you had to have a spring and fall apiary cleanup day, mandatory attendance. And we had to have registration with the Department of Agriculture, which is, which is a, a state law regardless, but in order to be in the apiary, you had to show proof that it was, your hive is registered. So in 2011, this is a year after the apiary was opened, and this is uh, two and a half, three years after the club was formed. Uh, we, our community apiary was at capacity. We maintained four hives in the apiary itself. The other 21 were owned by area residents. They didn't have to be Pittsburgh residents, but certainly um, within drivable distance for them to manage their hives. We were giving out scholarships for two apprentices um, from grants that were provided by, excuse me, by Carnegie Mellon University and Lowe's um, hardware store. And they did that for three years. They did 10, 2010, 11, and 12. So we were providing equipment, bees, and education for two people every year. And to end of those years, uh, the apprentices could either purchase their hive to take with them or donate it back to the, to the um, club, in which case we used it for education or donated it to some uh, beekeeper that, uh, in the local community that, again, low income, but we lent it to or donated to them so that they too can partake in this, this uh, community apiary in their neighborhood. We were consulting with the city of Pittsburgh to develop an urban agricultural ordinance. Uh, at the time, there was none. Uh, they were very hesitant at first to allow beekeeping, but we convinced them otherwise. And as part of the deal, we were gonna work on an ordinance. Well, we got an ordinance in 2011, and uh, the unfortunate thing was very restrictive. Um, you had to go in front of a zoning hearing board. You had to pay a permit application fee of $275, and that $275 was non-refundable if you got denied your permit. And what was happening after about 20 applications of beekeepers going in front of the zoning hearing board, two of which got approved, unfortunately both of them were our club, we managed to do it, the other 18 got denied, um, we went to the city of Pittsburgh and says, told them publicly that we are not supporting the ordinance and that we are encouraging beekeepers to continue to keep bees, but don't tell anybody. Uh, the city got mad at us, but you know, play politics with politics. Uh, we ultimately got changed and we'll, and we'll talk about that, but we also at that time were collaborating with other communities because they saw what Pittsburgh was doing and they wanted to be like Pittsburgh and wanted to have an ordinance. Uh, the unfortunate thing is during that process they copied Pittsburgh's ordinance, so we had several bad ordinances out there. So 2011 was a rough year, um, but we kept going. We developed a strong leadership core. We had several people in our executive um, committee that were educated about bees and, and really had good, strong leadership. Uh, we were in the process of seeking good structure for task groups. We needed volunteer organizers, uh, lecture organizers, garden directors, somebody to organize the, the native pollinator plants in our apiary. We need a treasurer, right? I mean, we had one, but we were growing too big for what we had. So we were developing. We had to establish regular beekeeping meetings because up to this point, it was very random. We had to grow our monthly news blast. We wanted to put together an annual banquet. So we're still young, we're still growing. We had to develop a well-designed website because websites are very important in this day and age. And we developed an active uh, Google discussion group, which is similar to Yahoo groups and Google listservs and things like that. Um, so we were in the process of really growing in 2011. Well, in the five years following, we really took off. Um, the community apiary is still at full capacity. It's still very, very popular for tours. Um, again, the same numbers still apply. We actually have a second community apiary in development. We, after some hurdles with the city, 
um, changing the develop the agricultural ordinance with the city of Pittsburgh, um, some red tape um, with the community, the second community apiary. We finally got the deed cleared, so to speak, and uh, we're going to start dealing with that here probably next month, uh, clearing some brush and putting in a parking area and getting that. Uh, the interesting about the second community, interesting thing about the second community site, is um, it was an open space. It was a green space owned by what they call, uh, it's a group called the South Pittsburgh Development Corps, which basically manages open vacant space and kind of puts you know nice signs up and things like that. Well, they had this two acre site that they were willing to let us use for the community apiary. The problem was that the deed stated it had to remain green space. And it had to, um, anything that was done on it had to benefit the environment. Well, unfortunately, the city's definition of green space um, prohibited any type of structure, and they considered beehive structures. And after we explained to them that they are not technically structures, they're not on foundation, they're on cinder blocks, blah, 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 uh, we went round and round, and the legal department stuck it out and still said, nope, um, you're putting cinder blocks down, that's a foundation, these are structures. This is the kind of stuff that we deal with. So ultimately, um, from 2011 and to, until 2015, um, we were fighting with City Hall and, and legal and getting the deed changed and their definition of green space, and uh, we finally got it changed. So now we're able to be in there. It just took four and a half years to get there. We also fought with the City of Pittsburgh from 2011 and to, until the beginning of 2015 to change their agricultural ordinance. Uh, it took a lot of research, it took a lot of showing them that, hey, we have over 100 beekeepers in the city of Pittsburgh, you only have two registered, what's that tell you? Um, and we got them changed, so now it's a one-time permit fee, went from 275 down to 75. Um, it's a one-time permit, so it stays with the, the property, you only have to apply once, you pay the fee once, and there's no zoning hearing, which means doesn't matter what your neighbors think. If you meet your criteria, you can keep bees. And I, I failed to mention that when there was zoning hearings, the reason they were being, the, the permits were being denied is because we had to post these big bright orange signs. We call them the liquor control signs that you'd see in bars when they apply for a liquor license. We had the same thing uh, for the bees, which drew attention. So people from three blocks away would be walking by your property and see that you were gonna be putting bees in your yard. And they would come to the hearing and say, I'm allergic and that would be an automatic denial of your permit. So we got all that changed, which was a uh, headache, but uh, we got it changed successfully. And we continued to collaborate with other communities to show them the error in their ways that uh, banning beekeeping was not necessarily a good thing. And since then, we've had 15 other communities in and around the city of Pittsburgh that have added or changed their ordinances to allow beekeeping. So they either had uh, a ban on beekeeping and they've changed it to allow it, or they had nothing at all, and we put some strong language in place that allowed beekeeping and protected it from um, people who wanted to claim that it was a public nuisance and things like that. So a lot of work went into it over the last five years, and, and we're growing. We have a continue to have a strong leadership core. We have a very good structure for task groups. We have several different uh, volunteer coordinators, a, a really good treasurer, um, several different garden directors. So we've grown and we've, we've got that volunteer um, base that we need to, to grow. We have monthly meetups that talk about what we're doing. Our membership has continued to grow. We have 150 paid members in our club, which isn't a whole lot, but our monthly news blast goes out to over 1,500 people in the Pittsburgh area and beyond. We have people from several different states. We have an annual member banquet, we have a website, and of course our active Google discussion group. So we've grown, grown uh, and we've become very, very active. So where do we go from here? Um, this is always the struggle because you have the same people in the, in the same positions and people get burnt out and, and ideas change, but we continue to maintain demonstration hives at Whole Foods. Um, we're gonna put some more hives in at the second Whole Foods that's opening up. We've got hives at the zoo and PPG Aquarium. Uh, we've got hives on top of the Google building uh, in Pittsburgh. We've got a couple of different demonstration hives just to show that urban beekeeping is safe and a viable um, way to, to, to keep bees. 
Our community apiary continues to grow. We have a lot of people that come just to, to help around the apiary, just because they want to help. They want to either weed, they want to uh, paint the fence. They just want to be around an active group, which is great. We also continue to work with the Penn State Master Gardeners. Um, this is a recent um, uh, collaboration with them, although we've been working with Penn State Extension for a number of years. We've just recently worked with Penn State Master Gardeners to work on our native meadow and the surrounding area, uh, the surrounding the area surrounding the fence. Um, they're using it for the projects. Uh, you master the master gardeners that are in here. You guys have your projects that you have to do to get your certification and maintain things. Our community apiaries are now on their list of approved projects. So we have a lot of input from the master gardeners in terms of how to deal with plants, how to plant certain plants, how to, to manage them, which is great because we're just beekeepers. You know, we don't, uh, we're not green thumb folks at all. Um, we just manage to get stung on our thumbs all the time. So uh, the proposed community apiary is opening in June of 2017. That has been accepted and uh, we just have to break ground, so to speak. So we continue to grow, which is a fantastic thing, but we've also been challenged. And I've mentioned several of those as I've been talking here this afternoon. Um, the biggest one was the, the NIMBY, not in my backyard. I want to save the bees. Let's save the bees, but you're not going to do it in my backyard. And, and we get that all the time. Yeah, that's great what you're doing, but don't do it in my neighborhood. So it takes a lot of education, a lot of education. Uh, but it's a challenge that we've accepted, and we're slowly making headway. Funding is a big issue. Um, we need to, to have money to, to create new fences and buy hives and equipment and uh, maintain, maintain our website, etc. Hive mismanagement is, is a challenge for us as beekeepers because with the new age of beekeeping, we get some folks that uh, feel that beekeeping is simple as putting a hive in the backyard and not touching it. And that can lead to problems for, for everybody in terms of uh, neighbors, uh, if it's a, if it's a uh, a uh, temperamental hive or even just diseases and pests that are associated with our bees. Vandalism, uh, fortunately we haven't had too much of an issue. We had two instances so far, three instances so far at the apiary. The first one was the very first year we started putting in a whole bunch of uh, plants and flowers. We had 20 uh, blueberry bushes suddenly grow long roots and walk away. Um, 24 hours after we installed them they were gone. Uh, so that was the biggest one. Uh, that was a big cut out of our wallet, um, but it's you know it was part of the neighborhood and it was that's the way it went. Um, the other incident was uh, two teens kicked in the door and wanted to see what the inside of a hive looked out looked like while we weren't there. Um, that didn't end too well. They were last seen running down the street waving their arms wildly. <laughs> and the third one was uh, somebody jumped over the fence kicked open the door and then stole a wheelbarrow. So <laughs> you just, you know, what are you going to do? You, you kind of chuckle and, and move on. But vandalism is something we had to be concerned about. Um, actually, believe it or not, with vandalism, what worked, oddly enough, there's no electricity on this site at all, but we put a big post with a remote camera sitting on it with a big sign that says, smile, you're on camera. Nobody that goes near it. So I, I don't know. Uh, developing new leaders, that's a challenge. Right? People get burnt out, they move on. Uh, we, it's a continual search for, for, for talent, if you will. Uh, political influences. Uh, we, when we were trying for the second community apiary, we were looking at a different site than the one that's been approved. We actually had a, a developer come to testify whose family is very well known in the Pittsburgh area, uh, very involved in politics, and this gentleman was not a gentleman, this guy was not a, uh, not a politician, but his family was. And he testified that keeping bees in urban environments actually lowered property values. And that's ultimately what got us denied. So we're up against political influences. Uh, at the time we had a mayor that uh, was more interested in going on vacation than actually being mayor of the city. That has since changed. We've got a new mayor who's very, very, um, a very good supporter of us and the chicken people and the grow, uh, the garden people and whatnot. He's been to our, our bee yard several times. He's gotten stung on the head. Uh, we're, we're good. So so political influence cause influences can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. How do we maintain volunteer dedication? Right. 
those of you that are involved in nonprofits know that volunteering is key, uh, but we can't overdo and overwork our volunteers. Uh, riding the urban beekeeping wave, it's trendy. How long is this going to last? We're actually starting to see a decrease in beekeepers taking, or interested people taking our bee, bee, beekeeping classes. So urban beekeeping wave, we'll take it while we can. We don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, we have to stress the importance of non-beekeeping tasks. We have lots of people that want to volunteer, but they want to volunteer with the bees. They don't want to mow grass. They don't want to weed. They don't want to paint. Um, so we have to, to keep those tasks in mind. And of course, success creates a public demand. We get way more requests for school programs than we can physically handle. We turn down probably twice as many as we're able to do, just because we can't get the volunteers to, to go do it. So with that, I will end the presentation. Again, I thank you very much for having me today, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Some of the people started to kind of protect the hives? I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the community, um, she mentioned about the people protecting the hives. And, and actually, this is actually what the apiary looks like, uh, well, last year, I guess it was, two years ago. Um, the community, once we got the green space up and running and the, and the apiary and the, and the flowers and the walking path, um, people actually were there daily. And you actually saw, when we were first working on this in 2010 and 11, you could stand there as we were working in the, in the bee yard and watch drug deals take place right around the corner. Uh, and that since went away because of the increased traffic. The, community, the people right across the street became very possessive. And if anybody came across onto that property that was not wearing a veil or did not put one on within a couple of minutes, they were out their door and confronting them saying, who are you, what are you doing here? And so it was open to the public, the outside of the fence area, but they would come out and they would confront and, and they've chased a couple, <laughs> couple of drug dealers off and really, so they've called some vandalism in and things like that. So they became, it was a, it was a um, and it still is, the community still loves it's there because they don't have, in that particular area, they don't have any parks. It just, I mean, they do, it's probably a half mile away, but for the people right here, it's a block or two away, and they, there's benches that we installed so they can come, and they've actually gotten used to the bees flying around and things like that. So they've become, they've accepted it and have become protective of it, which is very cool. Yes, sir. With that fence, aren't you um, interfering with the flight, flight path of the bees? Yep, good question. So the, the question was with the, the fence is, are we inter interfering with the flight path? Uh, that fence serves two purposes. One, for vandalism, you know, for security. But two, we do want to interfere with the flight path. We actually want them to go up rather than out. So people can walk around and, and work on the gardens and, and enjoy the, the pathway without having bees come zipping by their face at eye level. So if you were to stand outside that fence, it's like a tornado of bees that go up. It, it's pretty impressive. Um, but that fence is six feet tall. So it puts, even if they come right over the fence, which they do, um, they're above your head height. So it, it's meant to disrupt their flight pattern. It doesn't affect the bees in any way. And actually, if you look closely here, we the way we laid out the hives, each hive is facing a different direction. Um, so that actually minimizes drifting between hives as well as it distributes all the, the flight pattern. So yes, it does disrupt them, disrupt them but in a, in a good way. Yes. Yeah, well, no bears. Well, as I say, no bears in the city of Pittsburgh. But we did have a couple of hives get knocked down by a transient black bear three years ago, and it was on the side of the city where there were some parks. So that was expected. Uh, as far as interference with rats and raccoons and possums, um, no. Uh, our biggest problems that don't affect the bees are raccoons and rabbits, or not raccoons, groundhogs and rabbits. The groundhogs get up underneath there, and they'll they go after the water in the tubs, which is somewhere here. Right there's a water tub and there's another water tub there. We get groundhogs in there eating our, eating our water plants because they're green and succulent. And then the rabbits, and you can see along the edges, that's a lot of uh, chicory and, and other flowers, weeds that we leave. And you get a lot of rabbits that, that hang out in there, but they're not nuisances to bees at all. But other than that, yeah, we don't have any issues with raccoons, possums, skunks, um, you know, groundhogs and, and bunny rabbits are the, 
the two critters that we see all the time. So. And yeah, yes. What type of neighborhood did you get your second site The other site, yeah, the second neighborhood that we put the site in is actually again against a busway um, as one barrier. And it's actually against a 30, believe it or not, 30 acres the developer owns. It's going to eventually be townhomes. Uh, but it's in a suburban, I'll call it a suburban residential area. Still lots of houses, not as tight as this. They've got maybe a quarter acre instead of an eighth of an acre. Uh, but it's, I hate to use the word remote, but in Pittsburgh it's more remote than this site. Uh, we've already done our groundwork on that site from four years ago. We've gone door to door, handing out flyers, talking to people. The community is already uh, committed that once once we get it going, which we're going to start, um, we've got a um, contractor that's an excavating company is going to donate his equipment to move what we need to move. Uh, people wanting to donate money to build the fences, so that community is just as behind it right off the start. This one, this community, we had to work a little bit just because of the nature of it. Uh, the other community, we learned from this one, did our groundwork, and they're very, very much behind it. So they're, they've actually been a bigger pain in the butt to us than, than like, every year. Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? <laughs> so now, hopefully, when I tell them it's going to happen, hopefully they come out and volunteer, which I expect them to. It's, it's a good community. It's, it's, this is on the east side of Pittsburgh. Um, the next site's going to be on the south side, or the southwestern part of Pittsburgh. And our goal is to do three more like this, north, south, east, west, and then somewhere else central. But that's being optimistic at this point. So, yes? Uh, just a question about like liability of what volunteers gets hurt? Or Good question. Liability, yes. We, we were required, and we decided before we even knew that we were required, um, to have liability insurance. So we have a liability policy that covers our volunteers, our officers, and anybody, any club member or lessee that's in here. So if anybody does get hurt, um, we do have that liability. That being said, anybody that goes into that fenced area signs a liability waiver. So if you get stung and you die from anaphylaxis, we're not held responsible type of thing. Um, knock on wood, uh, we always have stinging incidents because it's the nature of the beast, but um, nothing, we've never had any kind of incident. Uh, I had a six-year-old kid get stung on the ankle, um, and he said, wow, that didn't hurt as bad as I thought it would. So, <laughs> you know, his ankle's all swollen. Uh, we actually had those kids, we have the 120 kids that come in. Um, the parents know what's going on. We actually had a, a young girl, she was eight years old, eight or nine, she was nine years old. Um, her dad showed up with her, with the group, and said, hey, I, I'm not staying, but I wanted to let you know that my daughter has an anaphylactic reaction to stinging insects. She has her EpiPen, she knows how to use it. I'm not concerned, she's in good hands. And he left. And she was, she was good. I mean, no issues whatsoever. She, she made sure that she wore the right, you know, she was smarter than some of the adults that showed up. You know, she, she wore the right type of equipment, clothes, shoes, you know. She was comfortable, I mean, she was in, she actually wanted to hold the B frame, you know, frame of bees, but we I said, hey, I can't do that. But um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's all about education. But the, the liability is minimal. Um, most times, people she's the only one that's ever showed up that actually had a true anaphylactic that knew it. Um, if other people showed up, they probably didn't know that they were allergic at that point. But we've had people who claim that they were allergic and then get stung, and it's you know what they think is allergic is just a normal. Action. But um, yeah, good question. We do carry liability. It's a one million li one million dollar liability coverage. It covers us, um, the officers, members, volunteers. So if something happens, but we're, we're kind of cautious about that. So. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you again. I appreciate your attention.